The following program was paid for by the friends and partners of Neil Thomas Ministries. I'd like to turn to 1 John chapter 3 verse 1. 1 John chapter 3 verse 1. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called children of God. Therefore the world does not know us because it did not know him. I want to talk this morning about the, the love of God, the love that God has for us and understanding, receiving and grasping that beyond a fact in our mind. And I, I think as we go through our Christian life, we begin to learn even more and more. We begin to experience more deeper that love, or at least that's really how it should be. The relationship should grow deeper. Uh, there's some passage where the Christians are, are called, particularly the church at Ephesus in the book of Revelation, is called back to their first love. They've forgotten their first love. And sometimes that would suggest that the first love is supposed to be the best love. No, they just forgotten their first love. But it isn't necessarily the best love. Love grows, a relationship grows, understanding grows. They needed to come back to the beginning because they'd lost their walk with God, their relationship with God. But that's not the best. It's the, it's the best when you first become a Christian and then it kind of wanders from there or it drifts or it gets tainted. That isn't the way it's supposed to be. The love of God is very deep. It's everlasting. There's more and more to learn and experience and to come to understand that. Something we should be actually hungering to know more in our life and to know more of in our life, the love that God has for us. And John, in writing his letter here, says, um, Behold what manner of love the Father has, has for us. The verse before, a couple of lines before, and John didn't write chapters and verses. He didn't put a, a cutoff between 2.29 and 3 verse 1. The translators did, for easy reference, trying to group things into topics. My Bible starts a topic about the children of God in, verse, in chapter 2, verse 28. Now, little children, abide in him, that when he appears we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of him. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called the children of God. Therefore the world does not know us because it did not know him. Behold could almost be interpreted lay hold, not just look, but look with understanding. Old English, behold your king. In other words, receive this man as your king. See this man as your king. Realise this man is your king. Accept him. Live according to it. Take it on board. Make it part of your life. Behold your king. Behold what manner of love. Lay hold of this love. Behold what manner of love. Look at it, see it, grasp it. Lay hold of this love that the Father has bestowed on us. What kind of love that God has given us that we should be called his children. The power, the, 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 how powerful it is to actually be a child of God. You are God's child. We talk about the love that a parent has for a child, the commitment to having it that we have for our child. But, and he's saying this is how God is towards us. Realise that you are actually God's child child therefore the world does not know us because it did not know him you know understanding this love is going to cause you to be somebody that the world doesn't understand because it's going to affect your life you're going to be someone at work that they don't fully grasp there's going to be a lot of things about your life that they don't grasp yeah why do you go to church so much people don't grasp it why would you go twice on a sunday why would you, why would you go twice on a sunday well, because i love him what do you mean, why would it go twice on a Sunday? Why don't we go three times or four times? Maybe that should be the question. Why not more often? If you're coming to be with God, if you're coming to, truly coming to his house, if you're coming to where his presence is because his people meet, if you're coming to his table as we heard this morning, why wouldn't you be wanting to be here? Because you really don't know God's love for you. Don't really grasp it. The priority becomes when you understand is how much he loves you, his love for you. Behold what manner of love the Father has for us. Therefore the world does not know us. The world doesn't know this love and it, and it has trouble understanding it. It's, it's all for a bit of fear of God. It's all for a little bit of religion. It's all for, okay, everyone's got their own ideas about life after death and even prepared to give some credit to what faith has contributed to our society, but 
The love of God affecting your life like that, the love of God, knowing that God loves you, the love of God for you being the most important thing in your life. That's beholding, that's understanding, that's grasping this love that God has for us. How powerful and important this love is. The world doesn't know it and the world's not going to understand you the more you grasp it actually. The world's not going to understand you. 1 John chapter 4 verse 8 says, He who does not love does not know God for God is love. He who does not love does not know God for God is love. God is love. That's what he is. God is holy and God is love. Two things the Bible says. I like to see it as holiness is, is his essence. Love is the expression of his holiness. God is love. And he who does not love does not know God for God is love. You know, your only way to know God is to know his love. You need to know the love of God. Great to know the power of God. Great to know the word of God. All these things are very vital. But actually, if you don't, have, if you don't know love along with them, 1 Corinthians 13 suggests you actually don't really have anything in your hand at all. You can have all knowledge and all wisdom, but if I don't have love, I have nothing. I can have the power to move a mountain, but if I don't have love, I have nothing. I can have the commitment to put myself on a cross, but if I don't have love, I have nothing. We need to know the love of God. We need to know it. We need to know his love for us. We need to know how it operates. God is love. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. Same passage goes on in verse 13. Pick up in verse 13. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit and we have seen and testify that the Father has sent the Son as the Saviour of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. That's where it begins. Hallelujah. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. It's beginning now. The relationship's beginning. When that person believes and confesses that, hey, I know that God, Jesus is God's son. Verse 16, and we have known and believed the love that God has for us. Do you? Do you know and believe the love that God has for you? God is love. And he who abides in love abides in God and God in him. Hallelujah. God's love, not man's version. God's love. Men will tell you what love is and therefore if you know God then you would love like this. No, God's love. We've got to get to know this love. We need to understand how this love works because until we know it, we don't know God. We believe the love that God has for us, verse 16. God is love and he abides in him, abides in God and God in him. Verse 17, love has been perfected among us in this that we may have boldness in the day of judgment because as he is, so are we in this world. Love perfected among us, that we may have boldness before God. You know, no thoughts of unworthiness. You won't feel unworthy. You won't feel not good enough. You won't need to measure yourself against others. You won't be worrying about judgment. You won't be worrying about whether you're doing things that aren't right before God and you're in trouble with God. That gets dealt with. All you want to know is how to love like God. Yeah, you want to lay hold of and keep away from the things that are going to hurt your life. You're not going to want to sow bad things, but it's not going to be about making myself right with God. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. Verse 18 says, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. See, John's already now needing to talk about perfect love. Put another adjective in front, because there's sort of these imperfect versions running around. Perfect love casts out all fear. Knowing this perfect love of God, knowing this love that God has for you, casts all fear out of your life. There's nothing to be afraid of when you know how much God loves you. You wouldn't be really afraid of anything. There might be concerns, there might be trouble up ahead. I'm not saying you don't get a, an anxious moment that causes you to deal with something, but you don't live in fear. You know, you know his love for you, you know his provision. You're not afraid to even do what he tells you to do. If you believe he's told you to do something, you know he'll look after you in that because you know the perfect love of God casts out all fear. Fear of facing him, fear of him not looking after you, fear of what the future holds. When you, when you fear, you're not trusting him. When you're not trusting him, you know why you don't trust him? Because you actually don't actually understand his love for you, his commitment to you. A little child trusts their father. And the example's been given for years of putting 
little Sophie up on here and telling her to jump off into, her, into Phil's arms. She'll do it. She completely trusts Phil to catch her. She trusts Phil. She gets up in the day and, and Sophie's not waking up with anxiety about food, supply, money. She just expects her parents will, bring, will take care of it all. When they jump in the car and they're going to go somewhere, she's not worried where we're going. Will it be okay? Will it be all right? She trusts her parents to look after her. Yeah, we come, she's gonna, Sophie's going to come to a day and realise that in the end, Phil and Vanessa can't control everything. They can't control the weather. They can't control the way children talk at school. They can't control what diseases or trouble happen. They can't control if she trips over while she's running, if the, if the ground is suddenly uneven. They'll, she'll find out there's a lot of things they can't control and then fear will begin to enter her life. Anxiety and worry will begin to enter her life. Will try to enter her life, let's put it that way. The world will start to say, you need to worry about this, Sophie. You need to worry about this, Sophie. Can you see? Dad actually can't watch this. Dad can't take control of that. Of course, common sense will tell her Phil can't control everything. She watches a movie and there's an earthquake. Well, will this ever happen here, Daddy? He's actually not in control of all that, is he? So Sophie needs to come to know the father who loves her, who is in control of that. Just as her earthly father was in control of that jump and her mother's in control of seeing there's enough food, she has a heavenly father far greater than either of them that's in control of all that and he loves her. The same more than them. And so she doesn't need to fear. She actually doesn't need to fear. You know, we fear when we don't know his commitment to us, his love for us. Perfect love casts out all fear because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. Fear involves some torment, some worry of what's going to happen, but he who's been made perfect, he who fears has not been made perfect in love. This is the reality. This is reality I, I have to face, we all have to face. When anything starts to sit with us and worry us and when we're on the third day of worrying, I really need to say to myself, hey, Peter, where's, where's your confidence in the one who loves you? Where's your confidence in the one who loves you? And to know how much he loves you, not just I've got to grab a promise and hang on and hang on. This is not some debate. This is not some am I, do I have enough faith? This is God loves me. This is not a fight to not let the bad voice beat the good voice. Actually, you don't have to have that fight if you know he loves you. You just put yourself in his love. You just trust his love for you. Sophie's not fighting voices every night that tomorrow will be all right, that there'll be breakfast, that the lights will work, that mum and dad will be there. She's not fighting voices telling her that. She, at this point, she's had no reason to doubt any of that. Sadly, like I said, the world's going to throw some doubts at her. Maybe one day she'll sit with a friend at school who say, my dad got up, I got up one morning and my dad was gone. And she'll think, could that ever happen to my dad? She'll get a, maybe her first little shock yeah, in prep that fathers walk out. She'll come home and say would, to mummy, would daddy ever just go? And it'll actually be sad. Vanessa will think, what a sad day. Sophie has to even have to deal with these things. But that's the reality. And the only thing that's going to get Sophie through is her coming to know her father in heaven and trusting him and relying on him and knowing his love and his commitment to her. Verse 19, we love him because he first loved us. Yes, he first loved us in Jesus. God first loved us. He reached out to us. He's made his love commitment to us. He's made his statement in Jesus Christ. It's back in verse 10 that I jumped over where it says, verse 9 says, the love of God was manifested towards us that God has sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. And this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. You know what the biggest problem is? You measure God's love for you by your love for him. You think he feels towards you like you feel towards him. You think he might not turn up like you don't. Like we don't, like we fail him, like we all do, every one of us. I, do, I would not want to think God loves me the same way I love him because that love's really not been 100% for all of my life. There's been times when I can look and say, I didn't love him as I should have loved him. In others, when I saw others in need, when I did turn my eyes away from others in need because I couldn't be bothered or whatever. 
or someone else was pressuring me that they needed me when really they needed me. Or I didn't give when I could have given, or I walked in fear for, for days. God, hasn't, God doesn't, doesn't, isn't like that. He doesn't doubt me. He doesn't walk around in doubt. He doesn't doubt me like I doubt him. He doesn't not turn up when I, when I don't turn up. He doesn't not carry through his words like at times I haven't carried through mine. You know what our problem is? We kind of measure God's love for us by our love for him. But praise God, he doesn't. In this is love, not that we love God, not the way you love God. But that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. What he put his son through. What love he put in his son's heart. The love he put in the, in, in the heart of his son. What he asked of his son when he stood in that garden and actually said to the father, I, I don't want to do this, but not what I want, what you want. What parent at that point in time wouldn't want to say, okay, we'll find another way. I'll try another way. Come on, God, you've tried another way. The law didn't work. Noah didn't work. You found other ways. Can you find another way? You've kept, you didn't give up and those things didn't work. Is it possible to take this cup from me and you do another way? But he didn't, did he? God's love for us, he put ahead of even his love for his son. At that point in time, he loved us with this purely sacrificial love. He loved us in a way that he saved Abraham from having to do. At that point, at that last minute, he turned Abraham back from killing Isaac. Don't know, I wonder what would have happened if Abraham had said, I'm not sacrificing my son. I'm not taking him up there and I'm not going to sacrifice him. Because it says that after Abraham was willing to do that, God said, now I know. Now I know that you won't hold anything back from me. It's almost like now I'm ready for my promise to be carried out. I wonder if he'd not done it, whether that promise would have been carried out. He needed Abraham to love him and be committed to him even beyond his love and commitment to Isaac. But he saved Abraham at the last minute from actually having to carry through that sacrifice and God had the same opportunity in the garden but he didn't. He carried through that sacrifice for us. This is the love of God, not the way you love him but the way he loved us. Praise God. Don't try to understand your, God's love for you by your love for him or even someone else's love for him. Someone else's love for him. Don't learn off their love for him. Be challenged by people's love and commitment back towards God, but don't think that's the perfection of the love of God. That the love of God is in God and comes to us from him. Verse 20 says, if someone says, I love God, I love the way mine has it in brackets, someone says, I love God, and hates his brother, he's a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he's not seen? And this is the commandment we have from him, that he who loves God must love his brother also. You don't love your brother because you don't love God because you don't know God's love. You're not able to love your brother when you don't know God's love. You, you hate your brother because you don't know God's love for you. When you know God's love for you, you don't hate your brother because you don't need your brother, to be honest. Your brother can't hurt you. There's no need to hate him. The love of God wants to get rid of the hate. You just don't want that feeling. You want to get rid of the unforgiveness. You don't want the bad feeling. You don't want it. It's not about the person. You don't want it. You don't, you don't need it. I don't need, this. I don't need to be upset with you because I've got God. I actually don't need you. I've got God. Best marriages are going to be between people who know God's love for them because then they're free to love each other without demanding. It says love makes no demands. Well, why do we make demands on, in our relationships? Because we don't know the love from God yet, so we're looking for it from someone who cannot give it to us and cannot meet it. They cannot. Your children can't. Your partner can't. Your parents can't. Your friends can't. They cannot. They cannot. But we're still looking for it from them. So we have trouble loving one another when we don't understand this love that God has for us. That's what John's led up into. It's a, it's a wonderful epistle and it, sta and it starts off by talking about how God has dealt with our sin and it talks about light and life and it ends up finishing up talking about this most powerful thing, the love of God. The love that God has for us and, and, and this love being made perfect in us. And I want to read those verses again. Love has been made perfect among us in this that we may have boldness in the day of judgment because as he is, so are we in this world. 
God loves us like he loved his son, yes? There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. Now, I'm not saying, you know, you, you know, if you don't like spiders, you don't love, know the love of God. You don't have to love, you know, if, I don't like, you know, you might say, oh, I don't like spiders or I don't like this or I don't like that. But when there's a direction, there's something that needs to happen in your life, you know, too scared. I'm too scared to do this. I'm too scared to do that. I'm too scared to get married. I'm too scared to step out. I'm too scared. I, you, know, I, you know, I see people with a call on their life sometimes to step out and go and do things, but they don't because they're afraid of the failure or the hurt or what will happen. Hey, God loves you. This might be challenging and it might be hard, but whatever, he loves you. He's with you. He's going to provide for you. He's going to meet your needs. You have a father who's not going to push you out there and let you be destroyed by anything. Do you understand how much the one who's called you to this loves you too? And is going to see you through and get you through this? Do you understand the love he has for you? That he will deliver you? That he'll look after you? Psalm 139. Well known by some, but there could be some listening that Maybe you read this sometimes in a little bit of a, a general way. This just applies to everybody. But this applies to you in a very personal way. Psalm 139 verse 1 reads, O Lord, you've searched me and known me. You know my sitting down and my rising up. You understand my thoughts afar off. You comprehend my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all of my ways. For there is not a word on my tongue, but behold, O Lord, you know it altogether. You have hedged me behind and before, and you've laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It's so high, I cannot attain it. This is God's commitment to know you. He knows all about you. You know, sometimes we want a partner. We want someone to love us. We want them to know about us. We want them to remember stuff about us. We want them to care about us. God, this is God. Your Father in heaven saying, that's me. I'm that one. I know all about you. I'm, I'm interested in you. I know. I search you. I look into you. I know when you sit down and when you get up. I look at your thoughts from far away before they even happen. And I comprehend the path that you're on. I'm acquainted with all of your ways. Before you speak a word, I know what you're going to say. I'm in front of you. I'm behind you. I've got my hand upon you. This is God's commitment to you. This, this is the love that the world's looking for in somebody, but nobody can give it to them except for God, the one who made them. This is the love of God. This is how much he loves you. And the knowledge of this love, you know, David, even in his before Christ existence, he had this confidence in God. He wanted nothing else but God. He just wanted to do what God wanted. You know, this was a man who loved God, who loved God's love for him, who loved God's commitment to him. He was deeply in love with God before everybody else and so God could entrust him to be king he didn't get to be king because he was in the family he was in the wrong family line God went and plucked him from the youngest son in a family that had no inheritance to anything except the youngest had to wait in line for six seven others he ended up making him king because he had this knowledge of God this heart for God this understanding of God's commitment to him you know, some, sometimes we know what God's waiting for to use you, for you to know how much he loves you. He's waiting for you to understand that because if you step out without it, fear will dictate your decisions because it certainly comes. Worry, anxiety, everybody else's ideas, things outside of God's word will dictate the decisions you make if you don't understand how much God loves you because you won't trust that love and you'll go and act according to something else. So he's waiting for you to know how much he loves you. You know, sometimes we feel like he's waiting for me to qualify in this or in this or in that. You know, the ultimate qualification is that you understand how much God loves you. Sometimes we say, well, he's waiting for people to clean up things in their lives and stop doing this or get rid of bad habits. Actually, they'll go when they understand how much God loves them. He's not really looking for certain behaviours. I think he's looking for this deep understanding of, our, of his commitment to us and how much he loves us. David talks about that there's nowhere he can go where God is not. And then verse 13, I pick it up again. It reads, For you form my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. 
I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvellous are your works, and that my soul knows very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed, and in your book they were written, the days fashioned for me, when as yet there were none of them. How precious are your thoughts to me, O God! How great is the sum of them! If I could count them, they would be more in number than the sand. When I awake, I am still with you. This is God's commitment to you, God's understanding. He made us, he personally designed you. David felt personally designed by God. I don't know if you just feel like you're some sort of mistake, some sort of you know, just mix of a couple of already mixed up people. God personally designed you. He personally made you. He said back before in the dust of the earth, David believed that back in the dust that Adam was formed from lays the original design for him. God knew that he would be born and he had a design for him. God in his foreknowledge knew and he had a design for what David would become. David understood the uniqueness of DNA, didn't he? In the dust of the earth you could find that my DNA in some tiny little molecules. The dust that became Adam, that became divided into Adam and Eve, that, that gave forth children that eventually brought forth me. From that dust that Adam was taken from lay my design inside that dust because God wanted me to be a certain way and a certain person. That's how much he loves you. That's his commitment to you. No one else has that commitment to you. Why chase it from them? They can't give it to you. They can't, they can't hand it to you. This is how much God loves you. This is his commitment to you. To so the point that he says, that when I was made in, seek, in secret and skillfully wrought in the lowest past of the earth, your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed. You saw me in the dirt. When God looked at Adam, he saw me. When God looked at the dust that he took Adam from, he saw you. He knew you and he saw you. He knew that you would come. Hallelujah. And in your book they were written, the days fashioned for me when as yet there were none of them. God has, has a book in heaven. And in that book is written the days that he's designed for me. And I want to, I want to lay hold of those days. I want to lay hold of those days. I trust that they're the days you're walking in. I trust that you are doing and being where you know God wants you to be. You can tell us all that it is, but you know. You don't just have to say that to, to fob people off. You actually know that you are where God wants you to be. That's the case for me. I am not here because my father was the one who ran this ministry. I've got involved in this ministry because God visited me personally and told me to because I was, had no intention of it. I grew up in a society where you don't stay around your parents. You go and do what you want to do. I had family members say to me, when are you going to get out of his shadow and go and do your own thing? When you're a young man, that voice is like, soon, shut up, soon I will do my own thing. In a culture where everybody goes and does their own thing. To stay with your family is weak, not strong. I know it is in some cultures, but not in mine. It was you go off and you do your own thing. And I had every intention of doing that. Until God visited me three times very strongly and said, you must follow this man and work with this man and help get the message of holiness out. And I said, God, this man is my dad. You understand what you're asking of me. Yes, that's what you must do. I know I've done what God, I know I am where he wants me to be. I have no doubt. I actually have absolutely no doubt. I have no regrets, not one regret. I have no regret in my life because I know I've followed what, what I know in my heart he's told me to do. I had d times to run off, desires to run off, thoughts of running off, off like everybody else. Absolutely, especially when the boss said stuff you didn't want to hear and didn't want to do. but I know I am where I want to be. You know what? I think everybody should be able to say the same. You, God has a plan for you. This isn't just nice poetry. This is truth. This spoke to me in my Bible college days before God prepared me when he told me. He prepared me. I knew that there was a book and I knew I still didn't know what was in it. I knew there was a call, there was a plan for my life, but I didn't know what it was. And, I, and I'm all for you don't even need to know your whole life. God gave me a general thing and then step by step, Abraham just got told to go. Then he got told, this is the land you're going to and that sometime your family will come here. He didn't have all the times. He had the general. He had each instruction along the way. 
And sometimes it's go here and then I'll tell you where to go next. Maybe based on our personalities, based on, you know, you need to get us through this and we think, gee, I can, I'm, it's not as scary as I thought. He goes, well, now I need to tell you the next part because if I told you earlier, you might have run. But he'll tell you as he needs to tell you. But there is a plan. There is a plan. Some of us need to ask ourselves, what was that plan? What did he put in my heart? What has he said to me? And I suggest to you this morning the reason it's not happening is you actually don't trust his love for you. You love him. You're here this morning. You love God. You believe in him, but you don't trust his love for you. When we, when we know his love for us, then we feel free to do what he tells us to do, to step out, to jump off, if that's what it is, if it's a jump off experience. We'll go and do what he says because we know he has our best interests at heart. We have great confidence in his love for us, in what he's written in his book. In your book, they're all written the day's fashion for me, when as yet there were none of them. Well, of course I want to go to that book because it's, the book was designed by the guy that saw my DNA in the dust of the earth. Everyone else never saw your DNA. Auntie might have some good ideas, so might your father, so might your wife, so might your school teacher. But they don't, they don't know you from your DNA. They don't know you from the dust of the earth. And they don't love you like God loves you. They don't love you like God. They can't love you like God. They're not, it's not possible. They're not made. They're not able to do it. God constantly thinking about us. When I, when I awake, I'm still with you. you know, I heard my father talk about this. I've heard Vass talk about it. I heard it first from my father years ago and it really grasped me, it never left me, that, the, that God sat on the, sits on the end of your bed waiting for you to wake up every morning. When I awake, I am still with, when I awake, I'm still with you. You're there, you're looking at me. The Holy Spirit, he's hanging for you to get out of bed. Some of you, he has to hang a little longer. But he's just hanging for you to get up. He's saying, let's get up, let's talk, what are we going to do? Let's get up, let's t turn that music on. Get up and put that hill song on and start worshipping in your heart. I love it. Let's do it. Wake up. Get up. Let's get up. He's sitting at the end of your bed. When I wake in the morning, he's there with me. He's with me. When I wake up, he's sitting there on, on the end of my bed. He's there looking at, looking at me, looking over me. had a beautiful experience once when I was full of fear. As a young boy, I was probably about seven years old and I was sent to my cousins to sleep. And I'd never slept in a room on my own. I'd always had Ian or Trevor in a room with me. And I was very excited because my cousin came to my house and I went to his house and he had two older sisters so I was going to be with my older girl cousins and they used to spoil me. It was great until my auntie sent me to bed and then it hit me. I'm going to a bedroom on my own. I wanted to sleep with my girl cousins but she didn't think that was appropriate. And so she put me in Barry's bed and I remember lying in the bed just overwhelmed with fear. I can't go to there. I would have gone at home. I would have run to mum and dad's bed, but I can't go. It's Uncle Graham and he'll bite my head off. He probably wouldn't have, but you know, you think he would have. I can't go there. My uncle won't receive me. I just remember lying in the bed absolutely panicked because they said, you need to sleep in there tonight. And you can't, that's where you need to sleep. I'm full of fear. And suddenly I saw in the doorway a young man dressed in, uh, looked like the undergarments of a Roman soldier. I can still see his face to this day. And he had black cropped hair and he had sandals laced up his legs. And he had his back in the, in the archway of the door and he was looking down the hallway and he was looking at me. And he said to me, You're okay, you'll be fine because we're here. And the moment he said we're here, I suddenly became a um, really strong sense that there was a, someone leaning over me and it was just the shape of a white, shape of white, sort of head and arms, that spread out across me and about this far from my nose. His face was right there and it didn't scare me, it comforted me because again, a voice in my head said, and he's watching you, you don't stop breathing through the night. He's actually that close to you. Watching your breathing, watching your breathing, looking over you, leaning over you. And then I remember saying good night to them both, going to sleep, never feared to sleep alone again, done it a few times since, been okay. Never been afraid to be alone or be in the dark or be in a strange place, never. And if ever I get a sense of you know, evil or something not good or, or even lonely or homesick, I kind of wish I wasn't here on my own, I wish I was at home in my bed with my wife, I think of those two angels. I think, I'm not on my own, they're here. Holy Spirit, God is here. Still watching my breathing. Still, check, still guarding the door. Because that's God's love. He's, he's put two to watch over me. To protect me, to guard, to guard, to guard me. I'm completely safe. I'm, everything's going to be alright. That's what Sophie needs to know. 
That's what she needs to come to grasp for herself, that she has a father who loves her and he's given her protection. He'll look after her even when she's in places where dad and mum can't because unfortunately Vanessa's going to send her off to school and be hysterical. She's going to send her off to prep and she won't be able to stay in the class. She has to go home according to our strange customs but that's what she has to do according to the, the theory at least by the time she's six or seven, even if she hangs on to us for as long as she can. And she needs the angels to look after her. She needs to know that trust of God, to know that God that loves her. Jeremiah 31.3 says, The Lord loves with an everlasting love. What a powerful statement. The Lord loves with an everlasting love. You know, it's what the world wants, isn't it? I'll hold you in my arms forever. Impossible, you'll get severe cramp. I'll love you forever, but they can't. Everlasting, everlasting love. Not possible. Often sung between two people that get a divorce anyway, but anyway. Or get a contract out on each other because they didn't like the way they split the money in the duet, yeah? Everlasting love. There is an everlasting love and it only comes from God. Mm. But you know why we sing about that and we want it and why we want to imagine Romeo and Juliet? always dying, always, just, they're just always dying. They're just always taking that poison and they're always dying together. So that it never comes to, we want that moment just to go on forever because you know what? We're made for an everlasting love. We're made for it and the world sings about it and writes movies about it and desires it. We're actually made to have it. You are designed to be loved with an everlasting love and it comes from your Father in heaven, not from a girl or a boy, not from your children, but from God, a love that we want and we're made to receive, but you know what, we can't do it for each other. But your heavenly Father can do it for you, so why wouldn't you invest in that number one? Why wouldn't you want to understand that love number one? That's why his love for you actually needs to come before your spouse and your children, because their love can't do that. And if you want to be really good, if you want to be a great father and a great husband, then you need to lay hold of that love, because if you think she's going to give you the love to love her with, it's going to fall apart. She can't give you the love to love you with. He can't love you with the love to love you with unless he's got that love from God. If you want your family to be full of love, man, you need to know the love God has for you so you can pass that on to your family. You actually need to spend more time with him than them if you want your time with them to be the best sort of time. If you put them ahead of him, this thing will decay because they can't, it can't live off itself without the love from the Father. Everlasting love. If your, if your family want to feel like there's a love commitment from their dad, from their husband, that's just there for the rest of their life and into eternity, that's the love of God, not the love of a man. We're not able to do it without his love. We need to know that love and lay hold of that love. Romans chapter 8. Verse 35, powerful chapter on, that begins in 6, we go, to, we go to 8, we love to study this chapter regarding baptism, the power of baptism, who, what God has made us, how he's dealt with our sin, how he's made us holy, how he has condemned sin in the flesh, tell a few people that, he's put an end to sin in the flesh, he's condemned it, how he offers us to walk in the spirit and not in the flesh, but, that, but it, it moves to this point. It makes a wonderful promise in verse 28 that all things work together to good to those who love God and those who are called according to his purpose, which is to be conformed, verse 29, to the image of his son. If you're called and you laid hold of God's purpose for you is to be like Jesus, then you'll know that everything will work to good to that purpose. So you have no fear anymore because you know that you are loved by one who's making you like his son and even no matter what anyone throws at you, God will turn it to that. So no, anybody's threats are, go ahead, whatever you throw at me, God will turn it to my good. You can go to bed and sleep well, even knowing people are out to get you. Eh? Life's out to get you, trouble's coming, diseases, something's out to get you. You think, well, come at me if you like, but God will turn it to good. You will lose, Satan. No matter what you do, you'll lose. You know, when he knows you know that, he kind of will leave you alone. It says, resist the devil and he will flee. It doesn't say you have to wrestle with him all the time on everything. It actually says he will flee. You know, there is a point where he flees. 
It's not a point that he just constantly stays. Some people talk like he's just always a man, he's always a devil. <gasps> he's supposed to run. Is he running or not running? What's going on? If you resist him, he'll run. And whatever it is right now, we go, oh, well, now he's here. Just stop, forget. Right now, how are you going to get him to run with what you're going through right now? Resist him. Resist him with what? Resist him with this truth. Resist him with the fact, hey, I'm loved by one that no matter what you do to me, God will actually turn it to good. Even so-called failure, even apparently he can turn it, to, he can take this right now and turn it to good. If, you, if you'll walk in his ways, if you'll walk according to the purpose for which he's called you, which is to be conformed to the image of his son. That's his commitment. Verse 35, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble, tribulation, which is great trouble, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword. So none of these things can separate us from the love of God. For your sake we are killed all day long, we are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded, some translations put I am convinced, this is, this is a, persuade, a persuaded to be convinced, yes, I've been persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come, there's nothing high enough or deep enough or any created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing can separate us from this love. I tell you, the love of a human, that can't be promised to you. No human can promise that to you. No human can promise that to you. And the truth is, we get just time separates us from our love. Death separates us from people that we love. Disease. Them having trouble. Their mind failing. Their body failing. Their problems overwhelm them and now they don't love us anymore. They don't have time for it. They're so overwhelmed by their own attacks. So many things can separate us from somebody's love for us. Even Not even their decision. Just what comes on them will separate them from our, their love for us. Distance itself will separate them from being able to love you. But not with God. Nothing can separate him. There's, no, there's nowhere too high, too far. There's no power. There's no force. There's nothing that can happen to you that his love can't get involved in, and love you and save you and deliver you and meet you and visit you and be there for you. He can go with you wherever you go. His, his love, nothing can separate you from his love. Hallelujah. No third party or person or power or place can separate us from the love of God. What a fantastic promise. Why would you want to put any other love ahead of it? Because you can get separated from those other loves. And you watch it and people's lives fall apart. And even Christians getting up and preaching and living out the Christian life, but they're completely reliant on this other love. And when it's gone, they fall apart. You've got to know God's love for you. That's got to be the love that you rely on, that you lean on, and that we, we absolutely depend upon. And just in finishing, John 17, words of Jesus. Again, the end of a long list of red-letter words. Jesus said some really strong and powerful things in chapter 14, 13, right the way through. Wonderful teaching. Get the, got time to do something? Sit down and read John 13 through to John 17. Jesus' words to you and me. Very challenging. And, he, and he's now towards the end. And verse 20 he says, I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. So he's saying, I'm not just praying for the disciples, but for those who believe through them, and that's you and me. This is you. This is a prayer for you. That they all may be one, as you, Father, are in me and I in you. That they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. And the glory which you gave me, I give them, that they may be one just as we are one. I in them and you in me, that they may be made perfect in one. And that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. Father, I desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which you have given me, for you loved me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, the world has not known you, but I have known you, and these have known that you sent me. That's us. If you're here this morning, I trust it's because you know that God sent his Son. That's the beginning. That's all you need to know. That's all you need to believe to begin to experience the love of God in your life and move into the victory that he has through you, baptism filled with the Spirit. It begins with, you know that God sent his son Jesus. 
Verse 25, O righteous Father, the world not has known you, but I have known you, and these have known that you sent me, and I have declared to them your name, and will declare it, that the love with which you love me may be in them, and I in them. The love that God has for Jesus may be in you and in me, that we would feel loved by God as if we were Jesus. He loves you as much as he loves Jesus. Really hard to gather that, because you don't feel like you deserve it because you don't love him the same, maybe. Don't know, why do we have trouble with the concept? Yeah, we're human and our humanity is looking for this love in other people. You know what? Stop that. The humanity, the love that your humanity is looking for, your humanity was made to get it from God. Don't listen to the lie that says, oh, you know, it's, it's the human man that needs the love of a woman. No, the human man, number one, needs the love of God. That's what you were made to be loved by. Yes, joining to another, becoming one flesh with them, absolutely. Loving them with the love of God, absolutely. But you can't love them with the love of God until you know his love for you. You are made to be loved by God. It's not, oh, my spirit is loved by God, but my human needs this. No, I'm sorry. You're human. You were made as a person. Adam was made to walk in love with God. And that's what you were made to be. You were made to walk in love with God. Your humanity, your human side. Not your fallen flesh, not the thinking and spirits of the world that that come against us, you're human as a man, as a woman. Humanly, the person you were made to receive your love from was God. And that's why the world's looking for an everlasting love in each other they can't find and denying that they want God. Singing about holding in their arms forever when it's not possible. Talking about this ridiculous love. Trying to find some human event where somebody lays their life down for someone and making a big thing of it because you know why? It looks like God. It's a little touch of God. It's a little taste of God. And we just dwell on that and dwell on that. And truth is, we'd like to have that every day in our life. But of course, we can in God. The love that comes from God. If you have been blessed by this message, please visit our website, neilthomasministries.com.